second about automotive computer networks. And uh, also in area C, we have the previous pre presenter, Jim, with Hacking Now Technology. So if you want to stop by and check some of that out after this, he'll probably be there for a while. So right now, Nothing Face and Automotive Networks. Thank you. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. okay good. Um, so I'm Nothing Face, and uh, this is the Automotive Networks. Um, give you a little overview of the uh, presentation. Um, just say a few words about myself, um, give you an idea of my perspective on, uh, on the topics that I'm presenting here, um, talk a little bit about you know, why, why any of you in the audience would uh, care about any of this stuff if you're not familiar with it, you know, what, what it might be applicable to, things that you do, um, give a little background on uh, electronics and automobiles, um, a little bit of the history, um, where it is now and, and where it might be going in the future, um, talk quite a bit about OBE2, the Onboard Diagnostics 2 standard. Um, it's a, um, pretty much a, a good state of where the uh, automotive electronic network buses are uh, present day. Um, you know, talk about the common usage of that, um, physical and data link, diagnostic modes, and some existing products. Um, try to talk about that with respect to the uh, OSI model of networking, um, just to frame it in, in, a, in a more of a computer science type of, uh, type of model that um, is, is more um, translatable to uh, things that people might be more familiar with. Um, and then again, present uh, Open Auto at the end, um, some software and hardware I've been working on to uh, implement um, these protocols. Um, so about myself, um, educated in electrical and computer engineering. Um, I have experience in uh, hardware and software design. Um, so I'm pretty you know, academic and professionally uh, experienced in that. But um, as far as automotive goes, I'm just sort of a Saturday afternoon mechanic. Um, you know, I'm not afraid of grease and a wrench, but I'm no mechanical engineer. Um, and I'm also concerned about privacy. Um, so why, why would anyone in the audience care about the uh, network buses on an automobile? Um, well, for one, there's, there's a bit of a monopoly uh, as far as the maintenance of automobiles goes. Um, you can very easily buy a service manual that tells you all little details about every mechanical part in the vehicle, every bolt, every nut, you know, the size, the specs, how to torque it all um, with, with a great deal of accuracy. But there's very limited information about electronics as far as the schematics goes, um, very high level. There's very little um, protocol information, and there's no source, no source code for the, uh, the you know, controllers and whatnot on site in automobiles. So as more and more functionality goes inside a black box that's running a, some sort of microcontroller or microprocessor and is running source code, there's more and more that's outside the realm of um, you know, an everyday uh, uh, you know, automobile owners to get access to and to you know, tinker with their own vehicle and modify it and maintain it as they see fit. Um, this also has privacy implications, you know, because there's as there's this black box is containing more and more functionality that's um, not observable by the user, they could very well be doing things that uh, the vehicle owner may not agree with. You know, could it be recording? Could it be transmitting information without you knowing? Um, there's no way to there's no way to figure that out because the, there's this black box that, that's not available to you, um, and and it also makes it the vehicle more under the control of the manufacturer. They can set in certain parameters, certain limits where the vehicle is controlled in a way that you don't have. Not only you don't have knowledge of how it's controlled, but you don't have the ability to change it to remove the controls or change the control to something you see fit. So, um, sort of giving the manufacturers more additional restrictions that uh, you know weren't weren't previously possible with the mechanical systems. Um, so, the background of automotive electronics and automobiles um, under the hood. Present state, generally, there's a number of different uh, electronic controllers in the vehicle. Early on, it started with fuel injection, the computers that control fuel injection, fuel mixture, and whatnot. Um, it was the early things to be controlled by uh, microcontrollers. Um, nowadays, things like anti-lock brake controllers, traction control, airbags, it's all fairly complex systems with a lot of sensors, a lot of um, outputs to control, and uh, it's controlled you know, more and more by um, software systems running on um, what are called electronic control units, you know, basically microcontrollers inside the vehicle. There's also user visible uh, systems. Again, more and more this is becoming controlled by um, by electronics such as the climate control systems, entertainment, navigations, communications like cell phone or, or other types of um, Bluetooth communication and whatnot. Um, early on, the standard, the first standard for the um, for uh, communicating with vehicles uh, was the onboard diagnostics one standard. Um, it was required by the uh, the e federal EPA in the United States um, to maintain certain emission standards that were uh, mandated by law. Um, the standard, the the federal law didn't require a particular standard in implementation, which allowed each manufacturer to go their own route, which they ended up doing. And there's a plethora of different um, different implementations that if you wanted to work with any particular vehicle, you have to sort of start from scratch to 
understand the protocol and work with it. It's all, they're all very individual. Um, the Onboard Diagnostics 2, which is so the current day mandate for vehicles made after 1996, um, again, is, is um, the federal laws in the United States is targeting, um, is targeting emissions control systems. There's similar laws, like in Europe, there's an EOBD standard. Um, in Japan and East Asia, there's other similar standards that require similar things. Um, the United States standard is, require, or is, is written by the uh, SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, um, and that um, specifies how these, what these networks need to do, the standards they need to um, uh, adhere to as far as interfacing and protocols and whatnot so that um, it's, it's easy to make interop interoperable equipment. Um, so the scope of OBD2, um, it covers a physical connector. There's a 16-pin um, um, connector in the vehicle. It has to be a certain place within the driver's seat. Um, there's a data link layer. Uh, there's three options. I'll get to those in a little bit. And there's a network protocol. Um, this is, they're standardized so that um, one of these three data link layers in the same network protocol has to be implemented in all vehicles. So um, this is trying to encourage the uh, ability to manufacture interoperable equipment to do diagnostic, um, diagnostic procedures. The only diagnostics that are required by the federal law are the emissions control systems, um, which is things like oxygen sensors, um, fuel mixture ratios, uh, RPM, so another um, very basic operating, um, operating sensors of the vehicle. Um, and, and that's it. So there's a lot of electronics in the vehicle that's not covered by the, the federal law for the, uh, the EPA federal law. So um, the diagnostic system set up, some of the manufacturers use that for diagnos diagnosing other systems that they have in the vehicle, but there's not a requirement for that, so there's not as much of a standardization of that. Um, and uh, again, so getting back to the SAE standard, um, it, it also specifies packet formats and data types for this diagnostic data um, that is required. And it also specifies a few other features that are not required by federal law, but are part of the standard. Um, and some manufacturers use them sort of at their own discretion for however it's useful to their systems. Um, to read and write ECU memory, the um, microcontrollers in the various units have programmable memory, flash memory, basically. Um, and you can basically get firmware upgrades for your airbag controller, your analog brakes, and then whatnot in your vehicle. You can also change, um, excuse me, change calibration parameters and um, modify the uh, operating characteristics of the vehicle that way as well. And there's also a security feature um, that is not a very um, cryptographically secure security feature, but it is um, a small barrier um, that is at the manufacturer's discretion to use for um, preventing access to certain features. For example, a manufacturer may feel that um, programming the anti-lock brake controller is a safety idea, a safety item that they don't, they don't want to be concerned with liability, so um, they, they put the security feature on it such that it's Another level of um, difficulty is to reprogram that so you don't accidentally um, do something unsafe and open them up to liability. Um, so one common usage of the uh, OBD2 uh, bus, this is probably by far the most common, is the so-called scan tool. Um, that's a name that's um, part of the OBD2 spec that SAE uses to refer to this, this unit that connects to the vehicle from outside the vehicle. And um, it's used to um, communicate with the onboard um, systems for diagno diagnostics. Basically, the way a diagnostic um, procedure works, one of the onboard um, vehicle systems would detect a fault condition, perhaps too much, um, you know, mixture too rich in the exhaust or um, some other type of failure of a sensor, um, something like that. Um, it would store a diagnostic trouble code, a DTC. Um, that's basically a number that represents the, um, the type of error that occurred and some more detail about it if it's, you know, um, particular oxygen sensor, what failure occurred, that it was it too lean, too rich, or did the sensor give some value out of bounds that says that it's failing or whatnot. Um, that may, depending on the severity of the error, it may cause the check engine light to illuminate, um, which illuminates on the dashboard and advises the driver that the vehicle has a, has a problem and needs to be serviced. Um, so the mechanic will, would plug in the scan tool, would be able to scan this, called scanning this code out, read it out, um, display it on a unit have the unit also describe what that code means, um, four-digit number, and then tell you that this means oxygen sensor in bank A, sensor two, detected a lean condition, and then they can use that as a, a sort of a start point for their uh, diagnostic and troubleshooting to fix the vehicle. So then once the mechanic fixes the vehicle, um, you can clear the code, basically erase it, the check engine light um, shuts off, and the car is back to, back to normal. Um, so that's, that's sort of the diagnostic use of the scan tool, and that's really only, as far as Diagnostics of the um, em emissions-related 
uh, vehicle subsystems, that's all that is required by the federal law and that's all that is required to be standardized. So there's a, a lot more available on the vehicle, but it's not standardized, so there's um, more, a little bit more difficulty in, in sort of understanding how that works and figuring out um, how to interoperate with it. Uh, another common usage that um, is not standardized, is not yet required by the law, but um, there, there's some talk that this might be required by law in the future, is the crash data recorder, which is linked to the airbags, which are required uh, in the United States by federal law to be in vehicles. Um, what a crash data recorder does um, is it's, it's part of the airbag uh, control module. The um, airbag control module senses what are considered called deployment and non-deployment events. A deployment event is um, conditions that cause it to trigger the, um, the airbag to inflate, um, you know, detecting an accident or whatnot, and based on sensor inputs, including accelerometers and wheel speed sensors and whatnot, um, or a non-deployment event, which is something close to an accident, but not quite enough, not all the conditions are right for the airbag to inflate, um, but it's a severe condition in, in whatever regard, nonetheless. Um, so this control module stores this, this event, a deployment or non-deployment event, um, and when it stores the event, it can store more than just the sensor inputs. It can also store the vehicle speed, engine speed, throttle position, brake state, driver's seatbelt um, position, whether it's been you know, engaged or not. Um, it can basically anything, any sensor that's available on the vehicle, it could potentially be storing that. Um, and then that's available for retrieval um, by, by anyone, by a mechanic or potentially law enforcement after an accident for forensic analysis of you know, whose fault the accident was or whatnot. Um, so this, this may have some privacy implications because, you know, people may not know that their vehicle has this information stored or they may not want their vehicle to narc on them, but they may not be under their control because after an accident they may be, uh, you know, confused, disoriented and not realize that law enforcement is downloading that information or perhaps when the vehicle goes off to be serviced, their mechanic may not have the best intentions in mind or may not care about the um, individual's privacy and may just, uh, you know, allow the uh, law enforcement to have the information um, or do whatever they want with it. I mean, mechanics may keep logs of this themselves sort of as voyeurism or whatnot. Um, and then, so, um, I don't know, I mean, just whatever, it's, you know, anything could be done with it and there's not, not a whole lot of control over this information. Um, and then once the vehicle is repaired, the uh, module is either reset, replaced, um, and basically sort of set back to normal and good to go again. The airbags themselves have to be replaced, so often the uh, the airbag modules, the control modules are also um, replaced. Um, I know this is a hand for a question. Um, um, actually, I'm going to take some questions at the end, so maybe we can get some discussion about that. Great. Um, so, getting back to the um, sort of the network stack that the uh, onboard diagnostics to um, specifies, uh, the physical layer. There are three buses that are. Um, specified by the uh, Onboard Diagnostics 2 spec. Um, basically, one of these three is required to be in by the federal law. Um, they're PWM, pulse width modulation, it's uh, 41.6 kilobits, uh, VPW, uh, variable pulse width modulation, 10.4 kilobits, and the uh, so-called ISO, which is basically standardized by ISO, but SAE references it sort of um, in consideration for European car manufacturers that tend to use ISO specifications um, instead of uh, SAE. Um, for similar type of um, functionality. Um, and that's a, an asynchronous protocol. It's very similar to a serial port on a, on a PC, uh, and that's running at 10.4 kilobits. And the fact that it's similar to the serial port on a PC is actually taken advantage of by some of the uh, low-cost interfaces to communicate with the vehicle. Um, and again, some of the manuf major manufacturers kind of tend to um, gravitate toward one of these buses, but these are not, um, you know, across the board rules because often um, vehicle, smaller vehicle manufacturers that are bought out by larger ones tend to um, utilize a bus that's more based on their history than based on the current owner of their, uh, the company. Um, and, and some other physical layers that are um, somewhat significant for uh, um, onboard vehicles are the CAN control area network, uh, which is a lot higher speed bus and that's often used for real time communication between controllers on a vehicle. Um, where one unit may be sensing a wheel speed and it may be transmitting that information over the CAN bus to the, uh, some other unit that would take action on that. Perhaps the sensor sends it to the airbag, or the airbag controller or the, you know, the traction control system that in real time for the operation of the vehicle, um, it uses the bus to, to communicate between the controllers. Um, 
and the usage of that is, is more in the, in the higher end vehicles that have um, more complicated control systems, more complicated electronic control systems, but it's increasing in usage and is also um, being seen more in the lower, sort of gradually down the line of uh, the sort of price points of vehicles. Um, and other buses that are um, significant, um, there's, there's a number of the, like I mentioned OBD1 didn't have a standardized, um, standardized implementation, so there's a number of different proprietary ones that manufacturers had, and then before that, some of the higher-end models from a number of manufacturers had buses on it for their own purposes, even though it was not required by law. Um, the data link layer, um, as specified by OBD2, um, is it uses um, there's there's a for each of the three physical layers, there's a, there's a corresponding three data link layers, um, one for each, um, but they have some shared characteristics. They're all uh, half-duplex shared buses, basically. Um, they operate on a carrier sense, multiple axis um, type of paradigm. Um, where they have non-destructive collisions. Um, so there's a priority in the packet header that's as a system designed into the system. Um, and when two messages are being transmitted simultaneously, the higher priority message will be sent and the lower priority message will detect that a higher priority message overrode it. So there's no need to retransmit the higher priority. Harder priority messages continue to get through um, in a loaded bus situation. So you don't um, have a degradation of um, the, the bandwidth available when, uh, when there's the high utilization of the bus. Uh, the network layer um, is a standard network layer for all three of the buses, um, according to OBD2. Um, there are two addressing modes um, as far as addressing the controllers. Um, there's the, the functional addressing is sort of a, like an abstract um, fu you know, function, as the name says, a function-based addressing. It's used for certain diagnostic or calibration procedures, um, and it allows manufacturers to have flexibility in their implementation um, where in one manufacturer may choose to implement the um, emissions diagnostics feature in one unit where some other would rather distribute it between three or four and the functional addressing allows um, an off-board unit to communicate with both of those without having to have any knowledge of whether or not it needs to talk to one or two or more units, um, anything like that. And then the physical addressing is, is sort of a more standard um, type of network addressing where it talks to a particular unit and that's used more for things um, that are very specific to a particular unit, or like a programming a memory in it or something like that. And those are used for more of the manufacturer-specific proprietary type of, um, type of operations. And um, the packet format um, has a number of diagnostic modes, um, and the modes allow it to, allow you to run tests, query the sensor information, control outputs of it um, to um, basically do troubleshooting and, and get information from different sensors in a variety of formats. Um, to aid in, in troubleshooting problems with the vehicle. Um, there's a number of data formats um, for the diagnostic messages, and that allows different quantities to be represented in a, in a compact way. Um, there's two sort of um, two dimensions of the uh, specification of a data format. The first is uh, the scaling limit offset and table, the slot, uh, and that maps the, the raw bits uh, and bytes to a meaningful magnitude. For example, an 8-bit value could be re represent minus 40 to 87.5 with a half, you know, 0.5 increments, or an 8-bit value could represent any number of other um, sets of data, uh, sets of numbers, but the, um, the slot specifies how the magnitude is represented into a, a meaningful real-world quantity, and the um, PRN, parameter reference number, um, maps the data to a, an actual real-world quantity itself, where um, it, it references a slot, but it also uh, adds units and a description. Um, so that you can actually, with both of the slot and a PRN, take a piece of data and map it to a physical thing on the vehicle, whether it's a wheel speed of a particular wheel or vehicle speed or um, engine RPM or whatnot. And um, the diagnostic modes, um, this is basically the, the heart of the functionality of the, um, the diagnostic features of OBD2. Um, there's the um, ability to request um, a sensor diagnostic data from it, um, basically getting the uh, you know, what the current readings of it are, whether it's, it's in or out of its um, operating conditions, whether it detects a fault with itself, um, self-testing and whatnot. Um, has the ability to uh, have freeze frame capability to basically, you can set a trigger where certain conditions are, um, are, are met, then a, a snapshot of a number of different parameters will be stored, and that can be later read back for uh, trying to diagnose an intermittent problem with the vehicle or whatnot. Um, the freeze frame capability is also tied to some of the diagnostic trouble codes um, where when a certain error occurs, it'll also store freeze frame data such that um, 
you can determine what the values of particular sensors were, relevant sensors, when, uh, when a particular fault occurred. Um, you can, as I mentioned before, the read and clear the DTCs when you have um, some sort of fault with the vehicle. Um, and you can also do a, a onboard monitoring diagnostic, which is basically like a real-time um, drive around, like a drive test of the vehicle, um, where you can monitor systems um, either continuously, where you periodically get um, feedback from them, or on a polling basis where you, you probe it when you want its information. But you can drive around with the vehicle um, and, and monitor stuff sort of in real time as you're operating it to, uh, for additional troubleshooting capabilities. Um, and other, um, some of the other, uh, I don't know, le le somewhat lesser important diagnostic modes are um, you can read the vehicle information, um, such as the VIN, uh, the calibration data, memory checksums, and you can also upload and download memory to the ECUs. Um, the upload and download memory of the ECUs is not one of the things that's not mandated by the, um, by the uh, federal law, so the ability to do that to particular ECUs may vary depending on how the manufacturer decided to uh, implement it or implement certain security safeguards and whatnot. Um, so what type of existing products are there that um, communicate with these buses and whatnot? And the um, majority of what I'm talking about here are uh, products that plug into the vehicle, not products that are in the vehicle itself. Um, the, um, like you buy a vehicle and it has all these controllers in it, what can you plug into it to uh, communicate with the, the network on the vehicle? Um, there's the proprietary full interface products that are very functional, they're very expensive, they're the ones that the dealers have that do everything, they can program everything, they can calibrate everything, um, they can tell you every little detail about everything, but they're on the order of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, there's uh, also complete devices that are um, basically plugged between a laptop and the, and the vehicle, and they do, um, you know, a little bit, they're a little bit less functional. They generally do the standard diagnostic procedures, um, and that's about it. There's um, some free and shareware, or uh, there's proprietary and some shareware free software that will communicate with it, but generally that's a lot less functional than the proprietary type systems, and the, um, the hardware for those um, is on the order of, of hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, there's also components that implement one or more of the uh, individual buses, and those are you know, on the order of, of what small components are, five, ten dollars. Um, and there's actually a couple of the um, interesting free designs that um, allow you to, uh, with a, just a handful of um, parts of Radio Shack, um, basically plug a serial port from a laptop into the uh, ISO interface, because the data link layer for the ISO interface is uh, fairly similar, similar enough to a a serial port on a computer that you could just, with um, some physical matching, you can basically plug it right in. Um, so what type of software products are available? Um, there's a number of commercial and uh, shareware products available. Um, for most of the, the software products, standalone software products, the, the, um, the required functionality for the, um, the federal mandates is the most common support. Um, some of them have uh, additional functionality for particular manufacturers, but um, very few of them have the full support for calibrating and communicating with every vehicle, every uh, controller on a vehicle, the things such as calibrating air suspension and traction control and whatnot. Those types of features are not available. Sometimes the, um, they have the manufacturer specific diagnostic information, but not necessarily the sort of calibrate and set up um, features. Uh, free Diag um, is, a, is free software implementation of a scan tool, basically. Um, it supports the diagnostic procedures um, mandated for OB2, and it also um, includes a few um, diagnostic procedures for some vehicles, some proprietary um, diagnostic features, but that's about it. There's no, nothing beyond the diagnostics uh, for that, as, as the name suggests. Um, so Open Auto um, is a project that I've been working on. Um, it's a hardware, and a, a little bit of hardware, and mostly software to uh, implement these protocols. Um, the hardware is um, another uh, sort of serial port on a PC to the uh, ISO bus um, interface. Um, it's just a little bit, little variation on the uh, designs that are out there, um, using some more modern components, a little bit more reliable, I think, um, you know, a little bit cheaper. Um, and it was also um, I'm working on a, a repurposed USB serial adapter where um, the USB to RS-232 um, dongle can be Reprogram the firmware and it can be reprogrammed to actually do more than just the ISO bus, but actually can do all three of the, um, the SAE uh, required buses. So you could communicate with any vehicle um, with, that, with that sort of um, aftermarket firmware for the uh, serial or the open auto firmware for the uh, serial device. Um, 
and the majority of the work has been on the software. Um, I'm trying to um, implement a standard um, layer two and layer three network stack, the, uh, the data link layer and the network layer, um, such that the um, developing applications does not require starting from sort of the ground up um, to develop talking to the devices all the way up to your user interface. You can uh, sort of start with your, your generic network interface and move up from there. Very similar to the um, trying to model the API after um, standard network stacks for TCP IP and whatnot in modern OSs so that um, take advantage of reusing code, reusing the network stacks because that's um, should be the same through you know any type of application, but it tends to be re-implemented because um, most of the products are commercial proprietary. Um, and also working on some application software, but that's more of a um, sort of a secondary goal to the uh, creating the library, the um, sort of the generic library to uh, implement the network stack. And this is all um, free software and hardware um, licensed under the GPL. Uh, the network stack, um, it's a common API across um, all the networks that it supports. Um, currently, the um, physical layer just supports the ISO because that's the only hardware I have so far. But um, working on the, the USB adapter that will provide the VPW and PWM support. And then CAN is something I'd like to support in the future because um, that seems to be where the uh, most vehicles are going as far as where the uh, interesting network communications on the vehicle is. Um, the data link layer supports the OBD2 protocol. And the network layer supports the OBD2 protocol and uh, a little bit of some of the manufacturer's extensions. Um, but it's intended that this could be um, expanded where the physical data link and network layers could support um, the variety of whatever's out there and continue to support the, the common API um, to develop the library separate from the applications. And when the library supports the bus, then the applications would uh, transparently also support that bus. Um, and some of the applications, um, these are more uh, Brainstorming, they haven't been um, haven't been started yet, but um, their uh, you know scan tool is sort of like a baseline application that would do the um, the diagnostic features that are required by uh, mandated by the uh, federal law uh, for OBD2 um, network probe and logging tool. Um, I think it's something that'd be interesting to uh, apply to a vehicle um, because things like TCP dump to just dump packets and Nmap to uh, scan for addresses and scan for um, you know, protocols supported by different nodes and whatnot. Um, it allow you to explore vehicle and try to um, identify the, you know, the unknown parts to the network and um, you know, reverse engineer the protocols and whatnot to support and eventually support all of the, you know, all of the features of, of any vehicle out there. Um, the uh, approach taken by most of the um, automotive uh, networking tools is, is tend to be more of a sort of an automotive approach to it where they don't apply the type of um, networking, network analysis tools that are used in more of the wide area networks and whatnot. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's sort of the, um, the uh, interesting feature that uh, Open Auto is trying to, um, trying to bring to these uh, automotive networks is that they're, as they're getting more and more complex, they're um, starting to become more and more like um, LANs and WANs. Um, and I think that the tools that are used there would be very uh, useful also on a vehicle. Um, and then sort of a, as a, um, an additional sort of different direction to take it as um, some high level monitoring and control um, would be uh, available and possible um, expanded diagnostics um, where you could have some sort of um, inbuilt computer on the vehicle that would continually um, and analyze the sensors and run more advanced analysis on um, sensor inputs and, and uh, determine failures long before the sensors would determine that they've failed or before the, um, it just completely stops working. Um, you could be able to log whatever's going on in your vehicle um, for whatever purposes, for diagnostics, troubleshooting, for development, improvement, whatever. Um, and even something as you know, simple as a configurable UI for a um, you know, detailed dashboard where you can rip out all your gauges and stick in a LCD and have themes for you know, each driver can have a different skin for how they want their, their dashboard to look and you know, have whatever information is available on the, uh, on the, on the diagnostic bus in the vehicle. Um, and so here's a, um, just a few of the references that, um, that I referred to in, this, uh, in the talk. There's um, the Onboard Diagnostics for Light and Medium Duty Vehicle Standards Manual, the uh, SE HS3000. That's um, basically the, this, a book of standards that, um, for SAE's um, specifications for all these uh, OBD2 uh, protocols and whatnot. Um, free Diag is a, a free software that um, implements the um, scan tool, basically. Um, and then Open Auto that uh, is an attempt to um, 
you know, have, a, have a, an open network stack and open API for uh, developing a variety of different uh, applications and whatnot to uh, communicate with the vehicle. Um, so I guess um, that about... Oops. Yeah, I'm going to open it up to questions and discussion if anyone uh, has anything. I've got a microphone here. That's Background. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, question on that uh, the airbag crash sensor. Is that a one-time event or is there a way to uh, query that or to, uh, to spoof it? Um, well, it is a, a one-time event. The, um, the, the, the airbag, um, the crash data recorder will only, I mean, a deployment event can only occur once because once the airbag goes off, um, you need to be replaced the airbag. So that's sort of a, a static thing that the, the, the um, crash data recorder needs to be reset after that occurs. Uh, the non-deployment event, um, I don't know, there's, there's not a lot of standards on that, but I believe that they, they either only record the first um, sort of non-deployment event or they record the most severe where they continue to replace a single non-deployment event with something that's deemed to be a more severe event, um, but that also sits in the vehicle and stays there until it's um, reset or the, the module is replaced. So is there a way to send it um, false data? The, the, the car is going zero miles an hour or 100 miles an hour? Oh uh, yeah, that, I mean that, that's entirely possible. Um, you can. There's a number of ways that can be done. You could, um, you could potentially put some sort of um, bridge in between the diagnostic connector and the vehicle so that you don't spoof the crash data recorder. You spoof the person downloading the information from the crash data recorder. Um, and then there's also the um, depending on how the vehicle is implemented, where um, where those pieces of information such as the vehicle speed or the uh, driver's um, seatbelt latch um, sensor or whatnot, however those are communicated. There's a variety of different ways that those can be communicated to the crash data recorder um, and depending on, you know, any of those ways could be potentially spoofed. It could be as simple as just cutting a wire and shorting the, the mechanical read switch sensor that senses that a, a latch has been pushed or, um, you know, disconnecting your vehicle speed sensor so that your speedometer reads zero and everything else thinks it's going zero miles an hour, and so that's what gets sent to the uh, crash data recorder. So there's a variety of ways that that could be addressed, but the implementations would be very different, so it would be uh, dependent on the vehicle. Hey, Any question? Um, how much bandwidth is um, needed for the ECU to, to, um, to talk to the uh, like fuel injectors and stuff? Because those are opening and closing really fast, so they need to be able to talk in like real time, and all those standards that you were talking about have like really low amounts of bandwidth, like 10 kbits per second or something like that. Right. Well, the, the, um, the three uh, OBD2 buses are only for diagnostic purposes, so they're not actually used for real-time communication of vehicle subsystems. So, for example, the, the messages to open or close the fuel injectors wouldn't be on that bus. Um, and actually, that is usually not even on the bus. The, um, there's a, a, an, engine con an engine unit that controls the fuel injectors, and that basically has wires that, can, that go straight to the solenoids that, can, that control the fuel injectors. The information, the real-time information that might be communicated is, um, you know, a sync signal for every, every timing around the, uh, you know, the cylinder, or around the uh, crankshaft or whatever, and that would synchronize some other parts in the vehicle, or a speed sensor would be then sent to the um, engine control every periodically, you know, 10 times a second or something like that to change how it would do the fuel mixture. But something, um, something of that nature would, would, is done by just a single, like a wire. There's a computer there that talks in the bus, but as far as the timing goes, it just um, plugs right into the fuel injectors and runs it on a separate wire. Um, another question? Yeah. Would you be able to run the vehicle using the network stack, um, like accelerating, braking, turning? Um, depending on the vehicle, you can, um, Actually, the vehicle I drive, which is a 2003 vehicle, everything except for the steering wheel can be controlled over the, not necessarily over the diagnostic bus, but over the CAN bus because um, the pedal is just a, a switch and the gear shift is just a switch. So um, everything, it's automatic transmission, uh, obviously. Um, so um, yeah, you could potentially control the majority of the vehicle um, over these buses. Yes? Uh yeah, what sort of a physical layer or physical protocol is the CAN network working on? Um, the CAN network is, um, it's a twisted pair. Um, it's uh, 500 kilobits um, and, uh, yeah, twisted pair copper. Uh, I, I lied. Topography. What sort of, what sort of pro protocols are we, we talking here? Um, well, CAN bus also is a, is a shared bus. Um, so it's a sort of a half duplex bus with a priority scheme and the addressing to um, prevent collisions. Um, and as far as the, the topology of the network of the CAN bus, that would really be up to the manufacturers. There's, um, 
there's, there's different ways you can use the CAN bus to um, provide sort of bridges and switches and whatnot. Um, but since that's not standardized, it's really up to the manufacturer to do what, whatever they see fit. Is there a, a, a connection between um, the, uh, the, OBT, the OBD2 bus and the car's anti-theft system? Um, yeah, I, actually um, a number of the vehicles have um, the ability to reprogram or, or sort of calibrate the um, anti-theft system where you can either disable it or you can, if you get a new key and you have to calibrate the new key to the, um, to the system, you can do that through the, uh, through the diagnostic bus. But again, that's not a, um, it's not standardized because it's not mandated by the government. So some manufacturers use these buses for features like that, but they're not required to and they may do it on a CAN bus and they may have their own proprietary way where you need to plug in directly to an ECU or something like that. At one time I had a Taurus SHO and it had, uh, when you got going fast, the car computer uh, cut the engine off of it, thought you was going too fast. <laughs> with, the, with that software, can you modify the settings on a car computer where it'll keep on going and not shut the engine down? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's one of, the, um, one of the things, the applications I think that would be a, a great use of this is that um, that was probably done by software running on the, um, the controller to the engine and um, it cuts fuel to the fuel injectors when it gets, sense, it's, it gets messages that says the speed is over a particular limit. So if you could rewrite that software, you could change it to do whatever you want to not cut out a particular limit. And um, being able to, that's, that's something that the manufacturers are probably are very tight-lipped about and they're probably not going to um, make available very easily or without a very expensive um, you know, licensing agreements and NDAs. So it's something that's going to probably need to be reverse engineered if one wanted to download a memory dump and uh, figure out, you know, reverse engineer it to be able to change the types of settings like that. But it would be possible. Got a yes. two-part question. Yeah. Uh, is it possible uh, to actually download all the code that's stored in that module <coughs> to uh, a laptop, modify it possibly in binary form, and then re-upload it uh, and have it, you know, be able to run? Is it stored that way on the module? Uh, yeah, on some vehicles, that's not a, um, yes, yeah, so on a number of, on a lot, actually a lot of vehicles, that's, that's a very possible thing to do. Sometimes there's checksums and some other um, security features that you need to um, sort of jump through. The, the security feature specified by OBD2 is used by some manufacturers to prevent you from even downloading the memory at all. Um, but once you get through those, those, those procedures or whatever they um, have in the way, then yes, that's, that's definitely possible. Okay. And on that same line, is it possible to uh, modify things such as variables uh, in memory in real time while the car is running, such as uh, adjusting the timing of, uh, you know, when the fuel injectors are going or something like that? Um, that, I'm not sure. I believe that that would probably be very specific depending on the, um, the implementation of the, um, of the vehicle, whether it, it used the um, sort of the program stored in memory to initialize its state and then used its internal state as it was running or if it worked on that in real time. Um, but that's definitely something that would be um, an interesting thing to explore with the uh, ability to probe these networks. In the scenario you mentioned before, which was uh, essentially drive-by-wire, yep. i.e. accelerator, et cetera, controlled by switches rather than mechanical linkage, mm -hmm. what kind of fail-safes are in place if the CAN bus fails? Um, not much. <laughs> it's, um, it's a, it's a um, what's it called? It's, it's a differential bus, so there's a little bit of um, you know, additional reliability in the bus because of that, but um, there really isn't a whole lot. Of, I think there's um, probably cutouts if certain um, sensors fail to respond, but um, there's a number of uh, things people have done when certain parts of it have actually failed in a way that prevents them from um, shifting their vehicle into drive because it thinks that the brake is applied even though it's not, and the solenoid that prevents the gear shift from moving doesn't move, so if you short a tail light, it allows you to open it. So, I mean, there's not a tremendous amount of, uh, of um, you know, the type of reliability you'd find on like fighter plane, fly-by-wire, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's, um, I mean, that would certainly be within their reason to be able to um, detect that and, uh, you know, um, do something about that to have some sort of heuristics for uh, fail-safe on that. But um, I believe the way that the auto manufacturers address that is by making, providing individual components that are basically reliable enough and then and hope they don't fail. I mean, some of these control features are not, are not done entirely over the CAN bus. 
it's not like the uh, accelerated pedal will be plugged into the CAN bus and then the uh, you know, gear shift will be plugged into the CAN bus and then the controllers would run off that. It's more like there's a, maybe a half a dozen controllers and the accelerator runs to the same controller that runs your fuel injectors. So if your accelerator got stuck uh, or if, if the CAN bus went out, then maybe your anti-lock brakes wouldn't work as effectively as they used to work. But your accelerator would still control your, um, your fuel injectors and if you let up it would still shut off even if your anti-lock brakes thought you were going 100 miles an hour. Earlier there was mention about uh, storing crash data in the controller for the airbag. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were having a discussion about uh, somebody trying to, courts were trying to use that data to incriminate uh, the driver. Mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion or decisions on who owns that data and whether, you know, there's sort of like Fifth Amendment implications there? Not that I know of. Um, you can actually, my wife is, uh, is a lawyer and you might want to talk to her. I'll be with her afterwards if you want to um, talk about some of the legal implications of that. But um, some of the uh, investigations I've tried to do as far as the crash data recorder have been met with, you can't have that information if you're not a mechanic or if you buy this $5,000 tool or if you're law enforcement. So um, I don't think that those discussions are, the people that have the equipment to work on this, work on these, um, these controllers, they would rather not have those discussions, I think. It seems to me that they'd rather have it in there and then pull it out when some, you know, drunk driver hits a baby and say, isn't it great that we had this information to prove that, you know, some real bad guy was really bad. And then at that point, it's like, oh, these have already been in your cars for 10 years, so, you know, what do you have to complain about? They'd rather not discuss it beforehand when people would actually get upset about it. Um, something like it's it's it, most people don't know the data is there and you can't get the data if you want to I mean you can't feasibly get the data if you want to you can technically if you paid a lot of money for a um, you know the tool to communicate to it but um, it's just somewhat it's intentionally made impractical for an individual to get at that data to know what the data is and to be able to control where the data goes <laughs> more or less These Back. last questions, it, it's making me think that with um, OnStar, it would make it possible for an onboard computer to immediately transmit through OnStar the fact that you had had a wreck. Or I, I guess they already do that. Yeah, like, I believe they, they do that. That's part of the but, features of OnStar. Right, but it, more detailed information, such as the fact that you were weaving and going 87 in a 50 and, and so forth. Absolutely. But, uh, that, that's, that wasn't really my the question I started out with, uh, it, that was just based on the previous people talking. Um, I wanted to ask if it's possible to turn off features that you don't want. For instance, uh, when I put my, it's a General Motors 2001 car, when I put it in drive from park, the lights come on, the headlights or the daytime running lights, whatever they call it. There are situations where you might not necessarily want that. Uh, like in the movie Fargo, they had to drive uh, in darkness for a few, for a few <laughs> seconds. Also, um, is there any way to shield the uh, onboard computer? I, I considered wrapping it in aluminum foil. I really don't know how to do it to stop the, uh, the blip blip, uh, you know, that's on your um, keychain remote that unlocks the doors and pops the trunk and all of that. I want to shield that receiving unit from receiving any radio signals because I do not use my um, re remote thing. I locked them in a drawer. I don't, I, I just, I use a key like it's a 1970s car or something. And so uh, if somebody were to ever have a clone of a radio device that could open my doors, I don't want their radio signal to be able to invade my car. Is that something that, that you address, or is that? Um, um, that's, some of those things could be, um, could be addressed by um, reprogramming the controllers. You could um, basically remove the functionality that responded to, um, you know, um, re message, you know, when it receives a, a transmission on the, um, the antenna for their remote um, door openers or whatever. Um, as far as actually preventing it from being received in the first place, I think that would be more of a, a hardware um, type of solution where you need to find the antenna and disconnect it or ground it um, or just cut the wire or something like that to just completely prevent it from being um, being received. As far as being able to easily reprogram those things, um, it's 
right now it's not possible to easily do that for an individual because the information is sort of held under lock and key by the manufacturers. Um, and that's, you know, what I hope to encourage with this is people to be able to reverse engineer the, the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, the software on their vehicles so that they can, um, you know, release free implementations of a new software for your vehicle that doesn't have this feature and gives you programmability of a couple other features. The state that I'm in, they, as part of your emissions test, they query your OBD computer at the emissions testing station. Is there some way to say to the state, my car is running clean, even though it may not be? Absolutely. That's, um, if you can, um, part of what, um, what the uh, Open Auto Project is, is trying to um, produce is a ability to communicate on these buses, and it's not a diagnostic um, unit centric type of network stack. It's, it's more of a generic thing. So you could use this to make a small microcontroller based system, put it under your dash and it possibly with a switch or something where you could enable the real bus when you wanted to communicate to you know, your mechanic and you can enable some other bus when you wanted other information to come out of your diagnostic connector for whatever purpose. Um, so that's definitely something that could be possible as well. Okay, uh, I'd like to point out uh, end mapping your CAN bus is all well and good, but your airbag is a large electrically ignited explosive charge pointed at your face. Please be careful. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, learn learn the failure modes of these things when when you when you uh, teardrop them and crash them uh, before sitting in the driver's seat. Um, second off, I'd like to find out uh, how do things like the OnStar receiver transmitter. Uh, connect to the rest of the of the vehicle. Is that over this bus or is that something else? Um, I, I haven't um, done any investigation as far as how OnStar works, but um, I would presume that it would use the CAN bus or something similar, perhaps a CAN bus that's not presented to the connector but is internal to the vehicle. Um, but I'm not sure because I haven't done, uh, done any research on the OnStar system. I just wanted to follow up on the question before regarding the use of the uh, 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 the black box data within uh, criminal proceedings. There actually was a case, I believe it was in Michigan earlier this year where a guy was uh, found to have been driving something like 105 miles an hour in a 35 and slammed into a parked car killing, I believe, three people inside of it. I believe they used that data to levy higher charges against him. I'm sure it was just subpoenaed. Where to begin? <laughs> um, first off, the uh, the SRS data, the uh, I'm sorry, the airbag data, mm -hmm. is that read through? I'm assuming it's a circular buffer. No, there's they store one non-deployment event, one deployment event that causes the airbag to deploy, and one redeployment event that's basically severity of a deployment event, but after the airbag goes off. Airbags can't reinflate, so it's kind of a not, redeployment is kind of a misnomer, but okay. that's essentially what it stores. It's just three values. The okay. non-deployment event is replaced by a more severe non-deployment event in some vehicles if that's uh, how it's implemented. Okay. Um, are you aware of any clearing houses for the data that a prosecutor or a lawyer would use that says, these are the cars that this black box data is available from. How does a prosecutor know that he might have this avenue available to him? As far as I know, there's only one manufacturer called Vetronics that makes uh, a device that can read this information. And on their website, they list all the vehicles that their, their, their tool is, is compatible with. So I don't know if that's a comprehensive list of all the vehicles that have that information. But as far as I know, that's a, the only list of vehicles that there are devices available that you can get that will get the information out. So practically, those are the only vehicles it applies to. OK, and sorry, last question. Um, you said the OBD2 systems, uh, they can potentially store the uh, vehicle identification number? Yes, they do. And they definitely do? You're pretty sure? Oh, they, it's definitely part of the spec, and that's required by federal law it's as far as the Federal the law is part of the specification. Right. So if you're being clever and trying to get around emissions, and you have your buddy plug his car, into the state-run vehicle emissions program, they're going to find out. Assuming that they log the VIN through that method, yes. Potentially, though. Yeah. OK. This would be potentially really um, great for small-time mechanics to get around having to spend $1,000 for these large units to do all this stuff. Do you know if there's patents 
that these car manufacturers have to stop um, a small time um, uh, fabricator from making units on the cheap? As far as I know, there um, I'm not aware of any patents, and I believe m the majority of the interesting information is probably protected by trade secrets because they would rather no one knows at all than a patent where they could prevent you from using it, but it would be available on the uh, USPTO's website where you could you could get access to it. I think they're more interested in preventing access to it than protecting a revenue stream that it may generate or whatever else. Okay, now as it being a trade secret, um, do you foresee this um, open auto having problems with the DMCA? Um, there could be some potential um, liability there. Um, but again, my wife can probably field those questions better that uh, she's a lawyer and um, she's here to help me out to keep me uh, on the right side of the law. Um, and, and she can perhaps answer some of your more questions about that. Um, all the stuff that you're talking about here, is it any of this real world information uh, that you've done or is this all conceptual? Um, no, the, um, the network stack I have implemented um, and the, the simple sort of um, network interface I have also implemented. Um, they're available for download on the website. Um, the, the more advanced um, sort of protocols and applications and whatnot are, 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 have not been implemented yet. Those are just in planning stages. So with all the questions that have been asked, all that's conceptual, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Because the, the state the open auto is at is it's an API. It's a programmer. There's no, there's no user useful applications yet. It's, it's an API that you can use and a library to use to develop these applications. So it's more of a develop, it's more interesting to developers, you know, um, practically at this moment. Um, have you done any work with aftermarket ECUs and everything like that um, as far as getting past law codes and just replacing the entire ECU with like an e-manage? No, I haven't. Um, I haven't had. Um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the ability to get access to a lot of uh, these ECUs. Um, don't really have the money to go buy a whole lot of them um, and whatnot. So basically, I just have my own vehicle to experiment with. Okay. Uh, I think this will be our last question then. For the diagnostics, it would seem the next logical step for the connector would be some sort of wireless implementation. Are you aware of any work on this by automotive manufacturers or the SAE? There's actually, um, there's discussion about, um, there's been, a, I've seen a lot of discussion about it. the most concrete I've seen as far as the onboard diagnostics three or whatever would um, sort of um, supersede the onboard diagnostics two. Um, there's actually statements on the uh, California uh, Air Resource Board website, which is basically the, um, they kind of instigate the EPA to make um, federal standards that, that um, have these uh, environmental regulations. They have actually made statements to the effect of having a convenience feature where you're, only the vehicles that are, are perform, malfunctioning are required for inspections with some sort of wireless um, snooping of the vehicles that have, you know, make, make, sure, you're, make sure your sensors are always working uh, up to spec and only the vehicles that don't have that are get letters in the mail or whatever to come in for inspection. So um, that's definitely very real and very real being discussed by the uh, California Air Resource Board, which basically inspires the EPA to make federal laws. So I guess that's it. All right. So that